Hello, my name is Sarah and I'm so excited to share with you some of my PhD work on American Robins. Across living things, we see that growth rate and the amount that parents invest in their offspring can vary widely. And this has consequences for the survival of offspring and the life history strategy that these organisms employ. Even within families, we see that growth rate and parental investment can vary, and this can lead to sibling conflict and even offspring death. In birds, this often results because birds are constrained to laying a single egg a day. Those earlier laid eggs often hatch earlier and are larger siblings by the time the subsequent eggs hatch, producing a sort of hierarchy of nestlings that compete with each other, um, sometimes to the point of death. So we know that egg laying order can vary in these asynchronously hatching birds, but I've previously studied egg resources, um, the amount of hormones and nutrients that are invested by a parent into an egg. And I wanna know if this variation in egg resources can either exacerbate or mitigate this offspring size variation. Are parents investing more resources into their first laid eggs to produce the best, most competitive offspring, or are they putting resources into their later laid eggs so these later hatching birds can compete with the earlier hatching offspring. We know in black-headed galls, these birds hatch asynchronously, and we know that later laid eggs have higher concentrations of androgen hormones like testosterone. If you take a gall egg and you'd inject testosterone and other androgens into it, these eggs will hatch earlier and grow faster. This happens in songbirds too, like canaries, if you'd inject testosterone into a canary egg, you produce a faster growing offspring. But I want to know how natural variation in egg resources beyond just testosterone and those androgens impacts the hatching and development of wild birds in wild settings. So to study this, I work with American robins. Like all birds, these birds lay an egg a day for a total of three to four eggs that hatch asynchronously up to three days apart. So that hatching asynchrony depends on when they start incubating, warming those eggs, and that incubation onset varies. Sometimes they lay one egg and start incubating, sometimes they lay all their eggs and start incubating. Um, in the wild, this really varies. But when they do have asynchronous hatching, these younger siblings can show delayed developments and are ultimately less likely to survive and leave the nest. From my earlier work, we know that Earlier laid eggs, so the first laid egg, are often lighter than later laid eggs. So here you see egg laying order on the x-axis, first, second, third, fourth laid eggs, and the egg mass. This is a prediction from a model that includes the random effect of nest ID. Um, and first laid eggs are significantly lighter than second, third, and fourth laid eggs in these robins. These earlier laid eggs, this first laid egg, also has higher concentrations of some yolk steroid hormones, including androgens like DHEA, which I'm showing here. Again, you'll see laying order on the x-axis and the predicted DHEA concentration on the y, but also other yolk steroid hormones um, like progesterones, like 17-alpha hydroxypregnenolone, and also some stress-associated hormones like deoxycorticosterone. However, if you would incubate all these eggs, first, second, third, fourth laid eggs in an incubator in your laboratory, like I did, you'll see that the embryo mass on day eight, so how large these birds are in the egg, does not vary with laying order. So any um, help that these birds might be getting with these different egg contents and different yolk hormones is not translating to differences in the embryo growth, at least not statistically significantly so. So that begs the question, do these laying order differences in eggs relate to the growth of the nestlings once they actually hatch in the wild? My first hypothesis is that robins are employing what we call a brood reduction strategy where they favor earlier laid eggs. So I predict that if all these eggs are incubated all at once, the earlier laid eggs will have an advantage, they'll hatch earlier and or they'll produce faster growing nestlings. On the flip side, robins may be employing a brood survival strategy where they favor their later laid eggs that face competition from those earlier hatched birds in the wild. So I predict that if we control incubation, later laid eggs will hatch earlier and produce faster growing nestlings. Finally, these robin nestling hierarchies may simply be the result of hatching asynchrony based on this incubation alone, 
not these laying order differences that we observe in egg size and content. If that's the case, if all eggs are given the same incubation regime, we expect that they would all hatch at the same time and the nestlings all grow at the same rate, regardless of laying order. How do I test this? I made foster breeds. I collected robin eggs the day they were laid and stored them in the lab so they were incubated by mom. I returned them to a foster nest in new combinations. I either had three first laid eggs, three second laid eggs, third, fourth, or a mix that had first, second, and third laid eggs. None of these eggs were related to each other and none of them were directly related to the mother that was incubating them. Um, oh, I should say when I collected the eggs, I put a plastic egg in the nest. That's enough to trick mom, so she keeps laying eggs. Um, so that's how I still had a foster nest to return these eggs to. When I return the eggs, I let mom incubate them. So I had a simultaneous incubation start for all of these different laying order combination treatments. I monitored the eggs, especially during that hatching window. So I visited the nest every day, sometimes twice a day um, on days 11 and 12. When the nestlings hatched, I marked them with a Sharpie so I could measure individuals every other day until they left the nest. I measured how much they weighed. I measured the length of their tarsus, so leg bone their head bill length from the back of their head to the front of their bill, their bill length, their wing length, the development of their body feathers. And then I took a photo of their wings so I could look at the development of individual feather tracks. In 2021, I set up 68 foster nests, seven to 33 of each treatment. 28 of those successfully hatched. Unfortunately, the rest were eaten by predators, the downside of working with wild birds. Um, so I only had two to 11 of each treatment. I measured 61 total nestlings, four to 28 of each of those treatment groups. Four to 24, sorry. Diving into results, this is hatching period. So on the x-axis, we have my treatments. On the y-axis, we have the incubation period in days. And you'll see that those third laid eggs hatched almost a day earlier than those first and second laid eggs, with fourth laid and the mixed eggs hatching somewhere in between. Next is hatching synchrony. So how do those eggs hatch relative to each other in each nest? And you'll see that I didn't have a significant treatment effect. So first, second, third, fourth, or mixed treatment, they all hatched within 24 hours of each other, which is interesting because in a natural nest, we can sometimes see that asynchrony being up to three days. But in this case, they all hatched in about 24 hours. Finally, I looked at nestling size and related that to laying order using MANOVA, where I put in all those body part measurements and I looked at an effect of time and laying order. And you'll see from those p-values that these were quite significant. Um, of course, age is significant. These birds are getting bigger with time, but the laying order was significant too. However, when I graphed them, um, you'll see here the laying order is in different colors, that NA is the mixed group, and this is the mass of these birds over time. They seem pretty similar throughout most of development. If anything, the only difference is towards the end of development. If I zoom in on that, you'll see that those first laid eggs in red produce nestlings that are a little bit bigger than the second laid eggs in green with third and fourth somewhere in the middle and none of my mixed nestlings even made it that far. Um, so it could be that this significant difference is happening right here. It could also be that I have some model overfitting problems because I simply didn't have enough nestlings survive. So for preliminary conclusions, hatching asynchrony did not seem to be impacted by laying order treatment, but the later laid eggs, those third laid eggs, did hatch somewhat earlier than first and second laid eggs, which points to that second hypothesis, that brood survival strategy, um, which is pretty cool. And there may be laying order based differences in nestling growth that my model is capturing, they seem to be happening towards the end of development when most of my nestlings haven't survived that long. Um, so I can't wait to delve into that a little bit more with more data. I have more data just from, the, from this set of nestlings. I have pictures of each egg um, and the mass of each egg so I can connect egg size directly to nestling growth. And I can analyze the development of wing feathers. Um, I haven't gotten through processing those like 6,000 photos yet, um, but I will do that as soon as I can. More excitingly, this year in 2022, I constructed 92 foster nests and 44 of them hatched, which was much better than last year. So this year I had 10 to 18 nests per treatment with nestlings. I added a natural incubation control where I left eggs in the nest. I had 27 of those nests hatch. 
um, for a total of 83 nestlings. So I'll be able to directly compare what a wild robin is doing to my foster nest. I measured 101 foster nestlings, ranging from 13 to 29 for each sample group, which brings my overall project total to 165 baby robins um, in this foster group, uh, 19 to 44 for each sample group. So hopefully I will have fixed those model fitting issues. And as a side project, I collected fecal samples so I can now connect bacterial and fungal microbiome to both laying order of these nestlings and their growth patterns. Can't wait to share that with you. So with that, I'd like to thank the Arbor property owners for the site access. I could measure baby robins and the trees on their arbors. I had two amazing field assistants um, that I'd love to thank. My wife helps out a ton when, I, um, when my field assistants couldn't be out with me. My lab mates were great as usual, and I had some wonderful funding sources. If you're interested in this project, please follow our progress. I tweet too much, perhaps, about this project on my personal Twitter account, and I also have a project Twitter account there. Thank you so much for tuning into my talk.